Greetings, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the first episode of the African Leadership Dialogue Series, which is a platform for African leaders to share their influences, reflections on the role of conservation in shaping the aspirations of Africans for development and prosperity. Uh, through this, as the AWF Africa Wildlife Foundation, we aim to position African voices towards shaping the conservation narrative on the continent. My name is Kadu Sebunya, the CEO of the African Wildlife Foundation, and I'll be your host. Today, we have a pleasure of hosting one of Africa's most prolific leader, His Excellency Haria Mariam Dizalen, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Welcome, Your Excellency. It's an honor to have you here today. Thank you very much, Kadu. Uh, if I may start uh, with the, uh, something that we, we, a lot of us don't see you uh, as such, because we forget that uh, before you were Prime Minister, you were a young boy, uh, a young man at that, a uh, water engineer, a lecturer, professor, everything else. Uh, so take us down the memory lane and give us a glimpse of uh, who Heria Mariam, without the titles of the mm -hmm. uh, great accolades of uh, Prime Minister. Thank you, Kadu. This is an opportunity for me to talk about my childhood and my human. I think uh, it's very important. As you said, uh, most, of, most people do not focus on uh, that we are human beings and we have a story to tell. So I was born in Ethiopia in uh, a very small rural town. My dad was uh, a teacher and he cultivated me uh, to become a teacher uh, as well as uh, a leader as well. So I think uh, my childhood was in rural Ethiopia and that has brought uh, lots of uh, uh, you know, visions to me uh, to stay in course. Uh, one of it which made me to become uh, a, a country leader was my country's uh, uh, situation in drought and famine. Uh, when I was uh, at the age of nine, uh, I, I am from the southern part of Ethiopia, uh, but the drought was and the famine was in the northern part of Ethiopia. And there is bumper harvest in my part of the country while there is drought and famine in the other part of Ethiopia. So then I was, we as students, I was only fourth grade by the time, and we were asked to collect grains uh, to the northern part of Ethiopia, going to each house uh, and asking them, begging them at least, to send this grain to the northern part of Ethiopia. That was the time when I asked the question, uh, why? Uh, we have ha a vampire harvest in the southern part and the, the other part of Ethiopia is in drought and famine. So that was the beginning when I was thinking uh, uh, that I should somehow contribute to address the issue of drought and famine in my country. And then again, uh, when I was second year in university um, in a, a civil engineering uh, course, uh, I, we also encountered a debilitating drought and famine again uh, after all these years. And that shaped uh, the course which I selected, which is water and environmental engineering. And then went for uh, you know, water conservancy as well as irrigation engineering to address the issue of drought and famine in my country. So that has happened. When I was a prime minister, uh, my, in the, my fourth term, my fourth year as, as a prime minister, uh, we were able to have a, you know, a countrywide food self-sufficiency. Uh, that is the achievement yeah. which has come from my childhood. So I think your childhood, your life and you know, experiences shape the way uh, to become a purpose-led uh, purpose uh, leadership in your future life. So that's I am. Right. That, that, that leads me to uh, uh, you are Prime Minister, uh, 
but you stepped up, standing uh, many of us on the continent uh, and the international community uh, because of exactly what you've said, you know, uh, you did a great job as a leader as, as far as many of us are, are concerned. Uh, 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 you know, which you set a precedence in, in your country that actually you can be a prime minister, you can leave office and you, you still can be alive and well as, you know, as we see you here today. Uh, How is life uh, <laughs> after being a prime minister with the everything and now stepping down from office. How are you doing? And what are you doing? What are you involved in? And how do you spend your day? Um, I think, as I said, um, I, my, I had the vision uh, to serve my country and my people. And I served from, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, as a governor of the third largest uh, regional state in my country. Uh, before that, I was uh, serving as, uh, you know, dean of uh, one of the universities uh, and, and the Water Technology Institute uh, in that university. And um, that shaped my life uh, very well because I consider myself as a servant leader. Uh, and I want to be service-oriented and service-driven leader. And I succeeded in doing so. Yeah. Uh, but life after office is enjoyable everybody has to look into it it's a stressful life when you are in office and when you get out you can you can see in a better way uh, you know the shortfalls you had and the successes you and you have huge uh, opportunity to reflect but uh, finally i came to understand that nature and conservation of nature is the most important thing above all things. Because uh, if you, we continue with this status quo of uh, habitat loss and uh, mismanagement of our natural resources, we'll end up in a dangerous situation in this globe. Yeah. Why we are suffering from global warming? It's simply because we destroyed our uh, natural ecosystem. And it's simply because we destroyed, uh, you know, the uh, the atmosphere, and that's why every country is suffering. Look now, the wildfire you see in uh, the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. in Australia, in uh, even now this year in Northern Africa, we have never seen yeah. such kind of wildfire in Africa, but this year we have seen it in uh, Northern Africa. So what it calls now is we have to act now and not tomorrow because we don't have time. Yeah. It's a, it, 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 is a, it's, it has become now, a, a, you know, a, an urgency and we do it in a, a, with a sense of urgency. Uh, so I see that conserving nature and, uh, you know, restoring biodiversity is one of the primary agenda that our leaders, especially African leaders, has to take uh, at, at, at the top of their agenda item. And our people also should understand that if you continue with this pace, then it's no longer we are going to survive in this globe. Um, I think it's very clear. Now, you know, the vulnerabilities of uh, the impact of uh, climate change, um, we are the most heat continent compared with other continents. You know, there is frequent drought and famine and frequent flooding, which is happening not only in Africa, but globally. But again, Africa is the most heat country because the capacity of us to adopt and adapt to this kind of situations is very limited. And we need to be very careful in handling these things. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever development we, are, we, have, we have achieved so far might be destroyed in, in a minute. Uh, you can see the floodings, you know, in many parts of Africa at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, all the bridges, all the highways, beautiful ones we built can be washed away very quickly. Mm -hmm. The money we invested in, in this infrastructure can also be invested back into nature 
so that we can uh, make harmony uh, between our development and our nature conservation. So I think that's what I sensed and I am committed to continue in my next phase of life uh, and service that conservation of nature becomes a top priority in my life. That's very much enjoyable. Right. No, we thank you so much for, uh, for, for that and that commitment. But I can't help uh, uh, hearing you, you know, looking ahead, uh, not to uh, ask you a reflective question in a sense that I spent a lot of my time uh, for quite a number of years uh, I've been engaging African leaders uh, uh, from heads of states to districts uh, to mayors uh, to ministers uh, as well as Africa's development partners in Europe, North America, China uh, in discussing uh, the issues of uh, biodiversity and and its role in, in human existence on this planet. Uh, but for Africa, uh, the role of wildlife and wild, wild places uh, in our development aspirations. Uh, in some of those conversations, uh, uh, one of the, uh, you know, a head of state told me uh, uh, he, how he was surprised that uh, in my conversations, he expressed surprise in my conversations that I'm really talking so much about development uh, and the linkages between conservation and the aspirations of his country, uh, national development plans, uh, and uh, which made me think that conservationists, we are having a different conversation with our leaders, uh, that uh, uh, we are not connecting the dots. It, it, there's, a, there's an issue from our sector ourselves. Uh, I wonder from your experience as head of state, whether you came across uh, conservationists uh, like us who uh, really talked so much like uh, conservation is added in itself. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, so other people call it tree huggers that uh, we, just, we, don't, we like animals more than people we c coming across that way. And therefore that has uh, alienated a lot of leaders and uh, folks who could have joined us in, in this uh, movement of conserving uh, the world. What was the experience as Prime Minister mm. then uh, in, the, in these conversations about conservation? Yeah, I think uh, my personal conviction is that uh, I am a Christian and I'm sure uh, Muslims also have the same uh, scripture and uh, conviction. You know, when the Ark of Noah has been you know, um, established, God has asked uh, Noah to put every uh, pair from himself, his sons and uh, daughters, uh, I mean his sons and his sons' wives, and then every species to each to get into the ark. So that is the world we have to see. Mm -hmm. That was the world which was saved, you know? And every species pair because they have to replicate. And human beings as well. Mm -hmm. So I think God has given equal right to both human beings and the animals. So that is the coexistence in that ark. They coexisted. They are not separable. God would have said, you know, I don't want uh, the animals because I am giving priority to the humans. So let the humans get into the ark and the animals disappear. But that was not the case. Mm. Both were saved together. So this time also, you can't, you know, se separate the human from the animals. They have to coexist. Humans without animals, and animals without humans, their coexistence is not complete. Mm. So I believe that humans has to develop and animals also has to be conserved. So there is no either or, mm. Mm. it is both. So I think we need development, we need it badly at this time, 
because we need a decent life to our people. But that is not in contradiction to the existence of wildlife. So the more we conserve the nature, the more we can make life easier to the humans. Because we are destroying in a, in a way that is not sustainable. You see? So if we make it a sustainable development, mm. then it all means that we can coexist uh, together with nature and wildlife as well, as a part of the nature. Uh, simply, uh, we can see simply what we are doing now. And uh, the destruction we are making because of development is threatening our coexistence and our, our, our existence. So it has become an existential issue for human beings to conserve nature. We wrongly destroyed it, the habitats. And we could have, you know, sustainably developed those uh, natural endowments we have so that we can, we can develop even better. Mm. There is huge wastage in this globe. Look the food wastes we are making at this time. So go to the groceries and, and supermarkets. <laughs> the more than half of you know, the produce that gets into the supermarket goes into waste. Yes. And that waste needs human beings to treat them. And you pay for treating that waste you created. And you expend huge amount of money in the treatment plants. Yeah, yeah. And again, you have huge sludge that is produced because of that. And it again destroys the environment. Again and again. So we are in, in a wrong track and we are sliding to a wrong direction. So we have to reverse those kind of things. Therefore, we can have more resources and also conserve our nature in, in doing so. And a good example is, you know, I was, I was not sure initially that the COVID-19 and Ebola and other viruses, we Africans and other uh, people in the other continent suffering has relations with habitat loss. Mm. So, but scientists told us clearly now that since we destroyed the habitat where the host of those viruses were animals different from humans, but now when we lost the habitat and we lost the, those animals, then those viruses were seeking for a host, host. and that host has become the human being. Yeah, yeah. And now we are suffering. So I think development and conserving nature, they go hand in hand if we think properly. It's our failure to think innovatively so that uh, they are not self-contradictory. They, they can go hand in hand. So I believe that sustainable development is, is, an, is, is a prerequisite for our existence in this, in this world. And as a prime minister, if you see, um, you know, we had lots of uh, infrastructure development. And the first thing we do was, uh, we, we, we did was uh, that we have a rigorous environmental impact assessment and selection of the project routes, especially highways. And sometimes you see destruction of uh, the environment and, and, and the conservation areas by constructions. Mm. And, but with a proper planning, you can avoid those things. Even you can make that highway beneficial yeah. to the conservation site itself, rather than you know, becoming a destruction to the nature you conserve. So I think it's a proper planning that's needed. So we were able to plan properly in some of the areas. And also we made mistakes in not properly planning, not involving conservation people into the plan. So when you plan, you have to do it in a comprehensive and multidisciplinary manner. So everybody has an input, including our peasants, our pastoralists into the plan. Then you can understand better. Our people understand much more better than we elites 
uh, especially in dealing with the nature. Yes. Because uh, they, you know, from the very beginning, they worshipped yes. nature. Yes. They worshipped big trees. They worshipped animals. They worshipped, you know, many things until they knew modern religious, uh, you know, systems in Africa. Yeah. And by the time they were able to keep their forests properly and also keep the, the animals uh, in a better way uh, than the destruction we see uh, today. today. Yeah, you, you touched on something that uh, I tell people that uh, as a CEO of, uh, of the largest African conservation organization uh, focused on Africa, uh, what, that, what keeps me awake uh, is really, and my response has been that uh, it's the decisions uh, Africa is making uh, on our aspirations uh, uh, as, as a people uh, uh, in terms of economic development. That is not factoring in the role of nature. Mm. Uh, and somehow that uh, we are going to develop and conserve later. Or, or uh, conservation is delaying our development or is against our development. But you make a very good point that uh, no, you need to bring everyone to the table uh, in discussing. And many times, the uh, conservation sector, we, we come late. Uh, seen as at development, uh, we are a group that doesn't want Africa to develop. Or, uh, and it brings me to uh, one of the things that we are focused on in our next 10 year strategy uh, as African Wildlife Foundation. Uh, and it's linked to Africa's Agenda 2063 20, 20, uh, uh, that was created uh, uh, and rolled out while, while you were in office. And, uh, uh, and we are using it here as a guiding manual, uh, even as we, you know, we implement our, our strategy. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on whether we as a continent are on track with a vision, 2063, uh, and that African leaders, including yourself, uh, preempted uh, this process eight, eight years ago. Because, uh, uh, like you said, uh, we need all to work together. Uh, we need all the master plans, uh, development, uh, conservation, health, uh, to, to be mapped so that everything uh, works together. So where do you think we are? In, in, you know, that, that, that agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Yeah. Are you satisfied that uh, uh, one life, if we did that plan and implemented it as, as it is, that uh, uh, we are going to have world life and world lands in a modern Africa as we aspire? Uh, yeah, I'm lucky to be uh, part of that planning. Uh, of uh, Agenda 2063 because I was chair of the African Union uh, by the time when uh, this plan was prepared by 2012. Um, we intentionally put uh, uh, biodiversity conservation as part of the Agenda 2063 by the time and uh, I'm glad uh, uh, to hear that uh, the African uh, Wildlife Conservation I mean Foundation was also part of that process. And I think it's for the first time that the African Union has put in its planning process the biodiversity conservation as one of the agenda and chapters uh, in, in that uh, plan. I think that's the, the beginning. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is not only the planning, but the implementation of that plan. And I personally believe that uh, not only the conservation agenda item, but also the other agenda items are also lagging behind uh, from the framework uh, and, and timeline which has been set uh, for the implementation uh, of each and every agenda items. So I think we have to redouble our efforts in uh, implementing with the remaining period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a 10 years plan out of the 20 uh, 50 years of yes. plan. Uh, that 10 years now is elapsing now. There is an evaluation process going on and we can understand which one 
we implemented better and which ones we are lagging behind. So by the next uh, planning period for the next 10 years, I think we can, we can somehow redouble our efforts uh, to implement those gaps we see from the evaluation of uh, the last uh, 10 years. Uh, I know for sure in our last 10 years planning, uh, the poverty reduction uh, to make, you know, in 2025 to have a zero hunger in Africa is lagging behind. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's uh, off track. Mm -hmm. So similarly, there are also other agenda items, especially in agriculture, which I know in depth, I championed for CADIP, you know, yes. Comprehensive African Agricultural yeah. Program, to have a sustainable farming and have uh, um, reduce uh, poverty to zero by 2025. We are remaining only with four years now, and I don't think we are going to achieve zero poverty line because most of the countries are above 10% of poverty line at this moment, but we have to stick to our UN uh, Sustainable Development Goal, which is on 2030 mm -hmm. to make zero hunger and I think we are remaining with nine years. So I think that's good enough if we redouble our efforts to make uh, zero hunger by 2030. So there should be some kind of readjustment yes. in our next planning session. I hope uh, the commission and the respective member states can take the conservation and biodiversity issue uh, at, as a top, one of the top agenda items for the coming uh, 10 years. And we have to advocate for that.